So are they going to still talk to you now that you called them Nowhere Washington? Well, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I made a joke that when I, I got to be a keynote speaker at this year's Hydrovision. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got up on stage and I'm like, you know, I said, this has always been a dream of mine ever since I was a five-year-old hydropower advocate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome to DAM, the official podcast of Northwest Hydropower. My name is Austin Rohr, and I handle all things communications here at Northwest River Partners. For our very first episode, I'm joined by the Northwest's foremost hydropower advocate, a seasoned power podcast guest, and my boss, Kurt Miller. Oh my gosh, thank you, Austin. Yeah, I, um, I really love all those compliments, and if I wasn't your boss, I would think that they were sincere. So. <laughs> So thank you for that. That was really nice. Well, at least one of them is sincere because you do have a podcasting belt. Yeah, so. exactly. That's right. I do have some. I have some credentials. I bring some credentials. Yes, yes absolutely. To the game. Absolutely. So I guess the first thing that we should probably cover is what in the world is DAM? What is this podcast all about? And I think the best way to sum that up is to tell the untold stories of hydropower here in the Northwest. Um, you know, when you think of a hydropower podcast, you're probably thinking, gosh, how can this be any bit entertaining? But we actually talked to so many interesting people, so many incredibly intelligent people. And when it comes down to it, we don't get to really expand on any of this stuff that we hear in the office. It really turns into a sentence or two that gets placed in an op-ed or a press statement or something like that. So uh, this is a great opportunity for us to be able to do that, to be able to tell the entire picture and uh, hopefully have some fun along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that was really well said. Uh, the communities that we work with, and that's you know some of our member utilities, that is uh, Native American tribes, uh, policymakers, um, you know, subject matter experts from all different walks of life. It, it, they're just, it's just humbling, right? It really mm -hmm. is. I mean, it's like, gosh, these people are so sharp and, and such also like really good people. And so I like the idea of bringing some of those amazing folks in and letting people get to know them a little bit better. And, you know, you and I have talked about, we really want DAM to be, you know, certainly, I mean, we're hydropower advocates, uh, but we're also clean energy advocates mm -hmm. and we're community advocates and we're salmon advocates. So, um, you know, we think that this is a great opportunity to not just talk about hydropower, but, you know, th there's a nexus, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you can't see this um, on the radio, but I'm putting my fingers together. Uh, <laughs> it's symbolic of uh, this. There's a nexus here where all these things overlap and interconnect. And um, I think, I mean, obviously I do this for a living, so I think it's interesting, but I, I really think a lot of people will think it's interesting once they get to hear these folks that we're going to be talking to. Certainly, certainly. It's really easy to look at Northwest River Partners as kind of a one or two dimensional sort of idea of an organization like, oh, yeah, you guys are about hydropower. But uh, it's like we're three, four, you know, well beyond into the next dimension in terms of all the different stuff that we have to learn and then take that knowledge and, you know, put it out into the into the world. So yeah, well, especially you, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so for those who uh, don't know, uh, Austin, uh, you know, we're a small group. We have um, Austin and then we have an analyst, Claire, and then myself as the only uh, three, you know, Northwest River Partners employees. And then we work mm -hmm. with some great consultants and, and things like that. But as a result of that, Austin is not only all things communication, but all things website, all things graphic design, <laughs> and uh, and so uh, yeah, I, I you're right. We do uh, in a, any small organization, you end up having to learn a lot of things, and mm -hmm. and uh, and that's actually kind of the cool part of it. I you know, for me, um, I've worked at different kinds of companies, and I love this ability to not just have such a small sandbox, right, but to actually be able to to do different kinds of work. I think it's really fun. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, I guess uh, you know, one thing right off the bat that I'd like to cover. Uh, we've talked about, you know, a little bit of kind of this organization as far as our structure, right? A very small team. Um, but who is Northwest River Partners? Right. Um, gosh, you said that so dramatically. I, uh, <laughs> like, um, yeah, so uh, that is, uh, you know, we represent a fairly diverse 
set of organizations, but primarily, and we were born, well, I, you know, that I think everyone understands who knows the organization, we were born out of public power. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so we represent community-owned utilities across um, the greater Northwest. So Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Western Montana, and also um, a, a few in Wyoming, Nevada, Utah. And uh, these utilities get some or all of their power from hydroelectricity. And, you know, we also represent groups uh, who, um, you know, like ports and farming, ag associations and things like that, um, you know, for some of the same reasons, you know, that they're reliant on some of the different aspects that hydropower, you know, dams can bring. So irrigation or barging or, you know, um, in some cases, the tourist industry, right? You know, there's different things going on out there. The dams are multi-purpose. And um, so, you know, it's, a, it's just a great group of people that, uh, and communities and organizations that we have the honor of, of representing. And, um, and we're trying to diversify as well. So, you know, we, uh, we brought in um, a, hydro, uh, a couple of hydropower manufacturers or one hydropower manufacturer and then um, a couple groups that are building pump storage hydro. Mm -hmm. um, and we're looking to, uh, we also, and this was really exciting last year, IBEW Local 77 um, um, in Washington State, they joined Northwest River Partners. And so, uh, you know, and we have other groups like, you know, other diverse groups who are starting to look at the organization. So, um, you know, so who is Northwest River Partners, as you said so, uh, you know, so dramatically before? I mean, I think that we are clean energy supporters who also care very much about, you know, practical outcomes for communities, for climate change, for salmon. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, kind of transitioning into this next topic, I guess, we are, in, in doing all the things you just mentioned, we're not just, oh, you know, those guys are hydropower lobbyists, right? Um, and, and, and what we do is, uh, I mean, it's really hardly could be considered lobby, true lobby work at all. Um, but we do a lot of different things uh, to address all those different aspects. And uh, for us, since since we've come here, it's been communications. It's been, you know, some government affairs work, certainly. It's been a lot of, you know, community outreach and getting to know all those people that make up our membership. But do you want to touch on a little bit, too, of kind of the different things that we do in order to sort of uh, I guess, fulfill the, the needs of those communities and give them that voice. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's, it's really thoughtful. I mean, I could almost ask you that question. Uh, so, uh, because you do handle all things communications, mm -hmm. and maybe you'll, you, you can kind of tag on to the end of my answer. Definitely. Um, yeah, you know, so um, uh, sometimes people call me a damn lobbyist. I'm hoping that's with the M and not an MN. <laughs> like the podcast. <laughs> right, exactly, just like the podcast. Uh, but I'm not a lobbyist. Um, I, uh, you know, uh, I, a registered lobbyist has to spend a certain amount of their time during those those activities. But I do uh, meet with, um, you know, uh, uh, staff uh, often, or not often, I do meet with staff of um, like the Northwest delegation, Northwest congressional delegation from time to time. And, um, and, you know, they're great people. I mean, you know, again, just more great people, right? People mm -hmm. who are, you know, everyone out there is like trying to do their best for these communities that they represent. And so, you've, and again, this is another group of really bright, really conscientious, good people. And so that, you know, so that part's fun. And it's a little bit newer to me. I, I didn't really have a government affairs background when I came here. Mm -hmm. So that's been fun to kind of I get to see how that works. Uh, my, uh, the, my, probably my, the, my greatest knowledge um, of government affairs came from, um, from Schoolhouse Rock of how a bill becomes a law. And, but apparently Schoolhouse Rock left a lot out. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, <laughs> so that's, my, that's my observation. There was a lot that wasn't in uh, the Schoolhouse Rock uh, right, right. Uh, cartoon. But in, in any case, um, so you know, we do some of that work. Uh, and also we work with consultants who have great expertise in that, in that space, and that's incredibly helpful. I mean, that's one thing I will say, and just like in any effort that you're going to make in, you know, kind of the business or, um, or NGO world or anything, you have to surround yourself with really good people because you just can't, no one can be that expert on everything. And so, yeah. uh, and if, even if that person was that expert on everything, no one has that much time. And so, you yeah. know, uh, as you know, we work with really good government affairs folks and 
good public relations folks, and um, and you know, and internally we have a really good team. Our board is diverse and awesome and knowledgeable. So, um, but anyway, I digress. So you, you asked what you know, what are some of our activities? So we do work in the government affairs space. Uh, another thing that's been really fun to get to partner with you on. Um, is our ad campaigns, mm-hmm. you know, and again, that's something I never did before, right? You know, I never, uh, um, never was involved in creating ad campaigns before, and so we again have hired some really great, you know, a really great ad a- agency um, in North to help us with that, uh, to help us with that campaign for our Powers Water, and then we worked with Two Degrees on our um, Pro Lower Snake River Dams campaign. And, you know, these guys are, you know, they're fun, they're creative, um, and, um, and so they've really helped us amplify in, um, like in 15 to 30 seconds, they tell the story of hydropower mm-hmm. in a way that I, you know, could never do, mm-hmm. right? You know, um, you know, and so that's, so that's really cool. So, you know, we do that um, and we rely on member support for those campaigns because it does cost money to get in front of audiences, right? But mm-hmm. one of the things we, we found, and you know this is in our polling, um, the more people know about hydropower and what it can do as a clean energy source, the more people support it. I mean, it's almost linear in terms of its, you know, it, the support there. So for us, it's like we have this incredible product and mm-hmm. people just need to know about it. Yeah. And um, and so and that doesn't mean that everyone's going to lo- love hydropower or any particular energy resource. But the, the the fact is, the more that we educate people uh, on hydropower, the more that they understand why it's so important. Mm-hmm. So we do that work. Um, you know, I have traveled a lot over the you know uh, COVID accepted, uh, but um, uh, throughout our membership areas. Uh, to get in front of um, to get in front of those member utilities sometimes at their annual meetings with their customers or members and kind of tell the story about hydropower connect with those communities listen to them about why hydropower is important to them um, and so that's been actually that's in some ways even though traveling for work is it's hard and tiring uh, it's also very invigorating and that mm-hmm. you know they're like gosh you know this um, you, you learn something every trip you know, um, and with every engagement. So um, I think, you know, those are some of the things we do. And then I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about, you know, like your social media work Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, some of the op-eds that, you know, that we've we've jointly written, even if your name didn't appear on them and (laughs) and things like that. But is there anything you'd like to flag in terms of some of those activities? Oh, definitely. Yeah. And I I don't want to put the spotlight all on you for the whole, for the whole podcast. So uh, happy to talk about that. But yeah, you know, the, the thing for, us is when I when I came in about three years ago, over three years ago now, which is crazy to think about. Um, you know, time flies in, in hydropower years. Yes, it does. Um, and you, if I if I recall right, you had short hair and no beard. So yeah, uh, was, yeah. It was, I, I it was a cut, different Austin. I had cut the long hair uh, right before. I was like, you know, I should probably cut this. And then COVID happened, mm-hmm. and there, it was just like, well, you're not going to get a haircut anyways, so <laughs> might as well embrace Go it. With it. Right. Go back to what you know. Right. So. <laughs> right. Awesome. But uh, no. So for us at the time, it was like. Okay, well, you know, I start here, I, you know, I get introduced to kind of the organization, you know, come into the office for the first day, get the laptop set up, all that kind of stuff. And it's like, you know, I've done a little bit of research, but um, there's really not much of a website here right. for, for Northwest Server Partners, right? You know, and, and what is there? I'm like, this kind of looks like, you know, HTML, for those that know web design, you know, it's like old HTML, uh, and then I, I'm going, okay, well, you know, what do we have? What's our kind of presence overall, you know, on the, in the digital space? Because that's how you reach people with communications these days. And there's no social media footprint. You know, I, I go on uh, YouTube, and there's a couple of, like, real old ads um, from the organization. There's, like, two different channels. So at some point, somebody... I think an ad agency had started one and then, but that wasn't really the Northwest River Partners one, even though it said River Partners. So um, now you have that to deal with where it's like, who's even the real account here? Mm-hmm. And then Twitter hadn't been touched in since like, t- I think 2014 was the last time anything had been on there. Mm-hmm. And so in a space where, you know, everyone is on social media, where we're trying to reach younger audiences, particularly, 
and really familiarize ourselves with people that aren't familiar with hydropower, we had to break into that space. And that's a real challenge, especially when you don't have the legacy of an old account. You look at, you know, you look at, you look at people that have been on Twitter, on Facebook, on uh, Instagram, you name it, having an account, you know, since social media's sort of inception, right around, I would say like 2010 to 2012, when things really start taking off in a big way, even by default, those guys have so many followers, they've got such an audience, because people at the time, you know, I I remember, you know, social media has changed so much in such a short period of time. And it's kind of interesting as a younger person, because it's, you know, you go to college, you learn about communications, things like that. But at the same time, I was 12, 13 when I was on, on, uh, you know, like MySpace and like YouTube had just come so you, out. You still know, you do know of MySpace. Then, oh right? yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember like before I even really understood what HTML was, it was like, I would go in there and, and you, everyone would make up codes. So it's like, oh, I can get this song on my profile or I, I can put like, you know, some crazy picture or make, you know, everything like a flame border around something or whatever. And so, uh, you know, things are obviously much different now. But one of the things at the time was like, there was a lot of uh, structure and I I haven't even really thought about this out loud until just now, but there was so much structure with social media of making the whole sort of experience funnel you towards following people Mm. because you needed to get, you know, put in different areas where, you know, I, I like ice cream, right? Like there would be a Facebook page that was just like, I love ice cream. And then you'd like that. And then you'd follow whatever they post. And so you do that for all these pages, for all these groups, for all these different things. And now flash forward, you know, you still see that stuff pop up sometimes in your timeline. And you're like, that, what in the world is that, you know? And then you realize like, oh, that's probably something when I made my account that's just always been there in the background (laughs) like i've never yeah exactly like i've never taken the time to go through it or whatever but if you're an organization that's out there that you know is in environmental advocacy or clean energy or whatever and you've been on there for that long you probably have a lot of people that really sort of don't even realize that they're following you anymore but they're there Mm -hmm. and because they have greater numbers they have a greater reach whereas we start in 2019 with a big fat zero right and that's hard to, to overcome. You know, it's hard, especially because now you have to compete with them. Right. So you have to compete for attention. You have to push yourself to the to the front and say, you know, pay attention to me, not them. Um, and that's just the natural competition of social media. I mean, right. there's always, you know, you're fighting for favorability with this, you know, computer algorithm yeah. that changes seemingly by the minute right. these days. Right. Uh, and so it's been really interesting, especially, you know, we went through – COVID, we went through a really, you know, tumultuous election Mm -hmm. and the, the landscape has changed quickly, even in that time. Mm -hmm. And the whole time it's like, okay, well, we got to grow an audience, you know? And so it's been helpful to have ad campaigns. It's been helpful to do, you know, we've done a lot of our own organic stuff and and also really tried to engage with that membership because a lot of those folks do have those accounts, you know, Uh, and they utilize them frequently. And, and it's funny when you look at it because, even an advocacy organization that's been around for a long time and you would think, you know, those guys have got to have a a huge following. They can't compete with a utility in the middle of nowhere, Washington. And the reason is because that utility has been using Twitter for 10 years, roughly, Uh to tell people when the power's out. And so everyone knows, hey, follow follow their Twitter and I'm going to know when my power's out. And suddenly you have a a community of 5,000 where Mm -hmm. almost all 5,000 are probably following you. Right, right, right. Uh, so those people, you know, we've really been able to connect with them because it's like those are the people that we're representing and we're representing those communities. Therefore, we want to connect with the community through their through their account. So are they going to still talk to you now that you called them Nowhere Washington? Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I will say there are some, there's some places I've driven through where I've seen like, hey, look, that's one of our members. Right. And then you see the population sign. It's like 67. <laughs> right. so it's like, and are, I know they serve a much bigger, well, you know, a broader service that, territory. That, but the, the town that they're based in sometimes, you know, it's like, 
Oh my gosh, there's no one here. The <laughs> geographic range of some of our members, mm-hmm. you know, is yeah. extraordinary. I mean, it right, you know, right. goes for you know hundreds. I think like hundreds of miles. Right. And uh, and you're right. And sometimes they have really sparse membership. That's actually mm-hmm. why they are public power. Like exactly. uh, back in the day when electricity utilities were. Um, being formed, they weren't being formed in rural, you know, Washington, Oregon, mm-hmm. Idaho, right? They, um, the investor-owned utilities, were, you know, the for-profit companies, they're like, we can't afford to serve these people out in the country who are so sparsely, mm-hmm. you know, distributed, right? You know, because we'll have to string 20 miles of wire to get to one customer, and mm-hmm. so it wasn't profitable for them, so they, they weren't doing it. So uh, a lot of people don't know that, you know, kind of today's, you know, um, Electricity of you know how you know of the 1930s, 1920s, 1930s was kind of like today's broadband, mm-hmm. where it was haves and have-nots, mm-hmm. and it, it was the same kind of divide, right? It's the same reason that it wasn't profitable for private companies to do that, and so uh, public power utilities were formed because they they weren't about profit; they were about service, right? Right, and um, and so and that's still their model, so. Um, they, you know, and that, that is, that is neat to, you know, we work for a lot of those, uh, organizations and those organizations care a lot about their communities and that's really special. So, yeah. you know, um, kind of going full circle on that, but it is interesting because the, of that, of that dynamic, but I love hearing about the social media stuff. I, as mm-hmm. you know, the only social media I participate in is LinkedIn mm-hmm. on a personal level. And, um, and I just do that by brute force. I figure if I post enough things, <laughs> <laughs> That's always a decent strategy. <laughs> I was like, I'm just gonna post, and then you see what sticks, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I, it's been such a uh, well, you know. So the funny thing, um, and I guess if this ends up not being, if this ends up being too long, then you can just cut it. So I'll just share <laughs> that the funny thing is um, kind of the story about how you and I met, right? Mm-hmm. Is that uh, we met through your grandpa, who has been in the industry for a long time, mm-hmm. and you know, uh, and by the way remains incredibly proud of you <laughs> and uh and you know he was like you know he's like you know my my grandson's in san diego and he would like to move back and you know um and he's just like so great and he's so smart and he's like <laughs> and, uh and he's like you know but we're you know trying to help him you know mm-hmm. get a job and i'm like you know and i'm like well you know why don't you have him send me a resume and i'll do uh informational interview with him mm-hmm. and i'll take a look at the resume and um, and then uh, and then I'll see if I can connect him with some people because I wasn't hiring right mm-hmm. and um, and so I looked at the resume and I'm like oh yeah you know you need to totally update this resume <laughs> yeah know? it was bad it, it was, was not, bad it was not an ideal resume <laughs> yeah um, just uh, just because it was dated like you mm-hmm. know you 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 were you know you were still looking like like you had still some of your high school jobs on right. there and right. stuff like that right um, and because you were too busy working in social media to mm-hmm. <laughs> to update your your paper resume yeah uh, but. In any case, uh, you know, as you and I were talking about some of the things that you were doing, you know, in terms of social media for your motocross magazine, which mm-hmm. was like really cool. Um, you know, I was like, gosh, well, we could use that. And I'm like, gosh, we could use that. And, I, and all of a sudden, I think it was like halfway through the interview. I, I said to you, by the way, I'm no, there's a no longer an informational interview. Mm-hmm. I'm interviewing you because I'm interested in potentially hiring you, you know, for the organization. And, um, and, you know, um, I'm so, I mean, I am, I'm just so pleased. I feel very mm-hmm. blessed um, that that has worked out. You've been an amazing partner and um, you brought so much. And, uh, and, you know, and like I said before, you're just willingness to kind of roll up your sleeves and it's like, okay, this needs to be done and I'm gonna do it. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, you are our graphic designer now. And um, also uh, maybe potentially someday also our, um, what are those called? Oh, our drone, our drone pilot. Oh, yeah, yeah. I still need to. That's still a whole other thing I need to get on. I did not realize how complex breaking into the the drone world is. But I mean, it's not it's not the wild west that it once was. It's right. like they have some serious oh, really? regulations around that. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, that's wild. So, but it's so funny because uh, you can once you do, then you'll be you know it's yeah. just another thing. Yeah, that certified you pilot. <laughs> certified drone. <laughs> it's seriously, it's a whole FF. Uh, oh, FAA, FAA thing. thing. I mean, oh, wow. it's like you become like you are now a drone pilot, right. recognized by the federal government. I right. mean, it's it's crazy. Well, um, that I, I did not know that. Uh, but yeah. one thing, you know, so one thing you might talk about just a little bit is mm-hmm. how you've had to pivot 
Because like one of the things that we initially thought is, you know, we have, and we do, Hydro Power mm-hmm. has great stories to tell and yeah. amazing communities. Yeah. So one of the things we were thinking about is, okay, we're going to go to all these community fairs and mm-hmm. we're going to record them. We're going to use our drone. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know, and all these things. Uh, and then COVID happened. Mm-hmm. And you were still in, and that was going to be, you know, before COVID, that was going to be the way that we were going to build a following. Yeah. And um, then all of a sudden, all the events were canceled, you know, mm-hmm. so, you know, did you panic? How did you feel? I didn't ever ask you, but like, mm-hmm. how did you feel when your plans were blown up and and uh, and kind of how did you adjust? Yeah, I mean, it was it was truthfully a little bit uh, terrifying, you know, it, almost more so than like the COVID thing itself. It's like, OK, well, what do you do now? Right. Because uh, especially coming from that motocross magazine background, it's a it's already a totally different environment in the sense that. Before it's like you show up to uh, to a venue, to a track, to wherever, mm-hmm. and people you, you know pretty quickly people recognize who you are. It's like oh yeah, that's the trans world guy. And then either they like you or they don't. But the whole goal is to try and win favorability so that you you can gain access. Mm-hmm. Then you just walk up and say you know here's my camera, here's I'd like to do an interview. You know can we record this, do that, mm-hmm. so on and so forth. And you know generally people are pretty agreeable in that sense and then you also get a lot of invites you know people are always saying hey come do this come do that we're having a an intro for this so on and so forth and you know you sign up for things all the time so you're always sort of out there moving around your schedule's totally filled up Mm -hmm. and in this space it's a little different where it's like you got to kind of go search for those things to begin with you know there's not always a ton of excitement and hype around things going on you know we do have you know certain community events that are really well done but for the most part you know you don't have uh as much of like a it's not event driven like not public event driven right? exactly Mm -hmm. exactly so there's there's sort of an access you know challenge that way it's also you know you're talking about federal hydropower you know operating you know facilities you're talking about um you know utilities you're talking about really major infrastructure that they don't necessarily want you just kind of, you know, bumbling around with a camera. Yeah, um, yeah. I think mean, I think you could get in big trouble for flying your drone over. Yeah, you know, some yeah. of that stuff. I've, right? I, yeah, I've, in the past when I've gone to uh, Bonneville on the Oregon side, I, and I didn't know this uh, really until I until recently, mm-hmm. that you can drive right up to the gate. You can, I think, even to go to the vet, visitor center, you have to do this. You drive up to the gate, a guard comes out, and they have like two questions for you, and one of them is, "Do you have a drone?" Oh really? <laughs> and then they, and then they will search. They'll do a walk around. They'll look through your windows. Uh, you know, for me, they look in the truck bed, uh-huh. and they make sure. Yep, yeah, okay. There's no drone here. Oh wow. And then they wave you on. And and then you get to drive over the dam, which is also just I, you really know, wild. the fact that the public can do that is yeah. crazy to me. But right. as a whole, that sort of thing is like you know you're not going to go trespass, and then you have to get permission, and that's always naturally tough. But then you introduce COVID. So now there's really no, you know, none of the, nobody's working even at the utilities. There are no community events. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, what do you what do you make content about? You know, how do you create, you know, interesting things when people don't get to see it? They don't get to experience it in any sort of way. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, too, it is hard to find willingness in this space. That's one thing that I found that's been, you know, really challenging because when I came into the job, my thought was there's really great things that go on in this in this whole world of hydropower and utilities hatcheries so on and so forth people need to see this you know as as the poll speaks to people need to be aware of it and then they're more supportive so people aren't aware of it i know that i certainly wasn't even you know having my grandpa work you know sort of in in industry you know aside from dinner conversations you know i didn't really know what went on Mm -hmm. and then i realized like well a big part of that's because nobody really i mean one people don't have the time a right. lot of times, yeah. you know, yeah. but too, it's like, you know, you send out kind of like, hey, do people want to do stuff? And it's like you get crickets back. Right. right? You know, right. people aren't that particularly enthused about doing these things. Yeah. And, and I, so, mean, I do think it goes back to uh, the organizations that we represent. Right. right you know, right. it's like they are, you know, they are lean and mean in many yeah. cases. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's why they need us. Right. Right. You know, you know that's, that's 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 true. I mean, I think that. Well, I think they need us because you know we're nice people. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. no, but they uh, they uh, but no, you're right. I mean, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, the kind of the public 
public power model mm -hmm. is because there are so many small or utilities, they kind of band together to um, to kind of bring in some expertise. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have our expertise, you know, there are other organizations that they like contract with like our, our, our landlords, right? Right, um, right, right. The Public Power Association. Um, among other things, they provide training to public power utilities all across the Western United States, mm -hmm. and you know that's um, that's a that's a function that the utilities themselves, you know, many of them just couldn't afford to take on. Right. But outsourcing it combined, you know, kind of kind of finding resources, then it, it makes sense for everybody. So yeah. that's kind of that's kind of that model. But yeah, so I think it, at the end of the day, was the magic then, you know, um, you know, really the campaigns that we've been engaged in is that, yeah. you know, what's really driven us yeah, you know, or think, our social media? I think, I mean, the timing wise, it worked out well. I mean, you know, we weren't particularly enthused by everything going on, but it, it worked out really well that when COVID hit, when it really, you know, became just like this huge hurdle of like, okay, the content strategies that I had coming in are probably not gonna work. Mm -hmm there's suddenly you know public process after public process <laughs> after public process right. that kept us busy it kept us on our toes uh and it required you know it demanded that we had response we had a campaign it gave us a lot of content you know it gave us a lot of things to talk about and it's also you know it's truthfully it's more interesting to people right it's newsworthy it's controversial it's kind of all the things that even though for us, it's like, you know, when is this going to end sometimes? Right, right, right. You know, for, for from a communication standpoint, it's like, well, this is a great way to build a following. This is a great way to reach people. Yeah. And it's also a great way to really, I mean, it, you know, it, it's a real sharpening of our skill set, mm -hmm. of our messaging. It's a real test of how accurate is our information mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, you're, you're, you know, having to really rely on this to be successful. I mean, right. you can't. Um, you know, you can't just put out flyers and different things and have it be all rainbows and sunshines all the time, right? It's like, you know, now we have to, we have to, you know, engage in this sort of battle on the front lines of, right. you know, the future of hydropower. Right. So that's been really positive. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's also the reason that this podcast is happening too. You know, it's like, what else can we do? How else can we share a message without... Um, running into the same hurdles uh, because we need to, you know, we need to be able to grow and be successful and create content in new and interesting ways. Mm -hmm. And through that, it might even open up new doors later on down the line. So it's, you know, it, you really have to just kind of be very adaptive to whatever the environment is. And I think that's the same in general for uh, content creation, for communication mm -hmm. in general, because, you know, kind of like I touched on at the beginning there's so much shift that happens just e even in social media, even in, you know, what can you say or, or what's going to be successful? Right, or, right, you know, right, right. Today, YouTube wants a 10 minute video. Tomorrow they want 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. The next week they want this many videos a week. I mean, it's like right. you have to, you have to be able to keep up. And, yeah. and there's other times where for us, at least it's like, sometimes you just have to look at it and go like, that's not feasible given our position as it's an organization. It's not who we are. Right, right. Exact, exactly. Right. You know, we're, at the end of the day, we're not trying to be influencers. We're not right. trying to be, uh, you know, the the definitive news source people come to for all things clean energy in the Northwest. It's like we have a very specific mission. We have specific goals, and we kind of have to stick to that sometimes. And sometimes you have to just say, you know, that's got to be what it's got to be. Right. Um, but, you know, we'll do we'll do the best with what we can and we'll find other ways to be successful. Yeah. Well, you know, there's one thing I mean, uh, for people. Uh, so speaking of neat people, you're mm -hmm. a neat person. I'm glad people are going to get to know more <laughs> about you. But, um, you know, I, I uh, one of the things people who don't I you know I get to be more the face of this organization. Mm -hmm. um, for, be for better or worse, <laughs> you know, um, and, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm the one who's normally doing some speaking, although mm -hmm. although you've done some uh, more recently, which is great. But the, um, the, the, the thing that you bring and a lot of people might not know is how strategic you are, um, how multi-talented you are. But um, the, uh, the other thing is I think that you and I really meshed well from the very beginning on the tone that we wanted to set. Mm -hmm for our communications, right? You know, I mean, I think that, you know, if you have someone managing your social media as we have you managing social media, you want that person to be in alignment with the vision of your organization. And, and mm -hmm. I think tone is part of that vision. And mm -hmm. we always wanted to be respectful. 
you know, um, this, you know, some of the debates, you know, that we are engaged in, um, they they can devolve really quickly, right? Right. right. And we have people who aren't happy with us mm -hmm. out there, and they can say some really um, some 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 surprisingly unpleasant things <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because, you know, people will quickly move from, I disagree with your statement to, um, to you are a bad person. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and so, you know, that's, you know, it, I guess that's been eye opening for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but I think that the thing I've always appreciated about you is, you know, um, that you try to handle those things with great, you know, dignity and respect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's who we want to be as an organization, right? Because, we, it's it's who we represent, right? We mm -hmm. represent organizations that are serving their communities, and that's mm -hmm. how they serve their communities. And so I think we have to follow that example. And, you know, it's not always, you know, sometimes it's easy to kind of get uh, wrapped, you know, kind of wrapped up in it, mm -hmm. but that's not who we want to be and, and, and who we are. But, uh, but you know, um, I guess maybe for me, I just say that, you know, the controversy has become... Um, more, you know, part of the job that I guess I'm mm -hmm. having become more comfortable with. You right, know? right. I mean, in general, uh, you know, I'm a people pleaser. I, you know, so mm -hmm. it's like, you know, I would like everybody to be really happy, <laughs> and um, and so you know, you know, these are challenges. But the thing that does always help me, and mm -hmm. I try to remember, is like, you know, even if someone is in a really emotional space. Um, is that like, okay, people are, you know, are doing their best. Um, and, um, you know, and, you know, maybe they don't understand why we have our perspective, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe they're not right, real interested in understanding that right now, but I think everyone does try to do what's in their heart and, mm -hmm. you know, and hopefully if we can have enough good conversations with people like, you know, in this podcast, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and people can kind of get to know us a little bit more then, you know, maybe that diffuses the situation a little bit, you know? Yeah. So I think that, um, I think that's, you know, I think that's good. And, you know, for people who aren't as familiar with the controversies um, around hydropower, I mean, really, um, you know, there's a, there's a couple different major controversies, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that um, per the Murray Inslee uh, report that, or recommendation that just came out, you know, I think that more and more people are recognizing exactly how important the dams are right. to, you know, kind of social equity to make sure that electricity is affordable for low-income communities, for reliability, and 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 maybe most especially to actually allow us to retire all these coal and natural gas plants. Because mm -hmm. when those plants go away, and you just start adding, you know, variable renewables like wind and solar power that can ramp, that can um, their their output changes really rapidly, and not necessarily the way that you want it to. Like you're dependent on really near-term weather conditions for wind and solar power and if mm -hmm. they don't if those conditions aren't there they're not going to produce energy right and so you have to have resources like hydropower you know that can you know can be on demand right that they can they can provide energy when you need it and they do that by having storage uh, and not in terms of batteries but in terms of water behind a dam that they can hold mm -hmm. and then they can release right so that part is awesome and and you know I, as you know I call hydropower the superpower of renewables because it comes with its own built-in storage mm -hmm. and it helps us add other renewables but so that's the great stuff right um, and of course I would lead with the good news right uh, <laughs> and then on the on the on the on the bad news side um, salmon in the Northwest in the Columbia River Basin in the Snake River but beyond, right? I mean, way beyond, you know, all the way up to Southeast Alaska, all the way down to Northern California. Salmon survival has been on a really steady decline over the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I think, you know, we mentioned earlier, it's like, okay, well, people want to do something about that, you know? And so for a lot of people, like, if the answer, if the reason that salmon declines are doing, you know, are, have been so dramatic over the last 50 years is because the ocean is warming, it's changing the balance between predators and prey. We're seeing many, many more marine mammals, you know, consuming many, many more salmon, mm -hmm. right? We're seeing the salmon, you know, food sources kind of go away in the ocean. If that's the reason that salmon are declining, then, oh my gosh, we're in real trouble, right? You know, what do we do about that? Because it takes a long time to change climate change, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think people, you know, feel the need. It's like, okay, well, 
we can't do anything about that, so let's you know tackle the river, right? Even if that's not where the problem is. And so I think that's where the nature of the debate in many cases comes from, is people who I think are, are really well intended, but I think that, you know, it's not like, you know, it's not like getting rid of the dams has no societal impact. You know, if, 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 it, if it didn't, you know, if there were dams and they weren't productive and they weren't there for any reason, then we would say, yeah, you know, a dam that isn't providing benefit to society shouldn't be a dam anymore because mm -hmm. it does change ecosystems and um, it, you know, it makes it a little bit harder for salmon to get past even when they do have excellent fish passage. But at the same time, you know, um, as the Murray Inslee report found, like these dams are essential, right? And so then when you start to think about it, it's like, okay, how do we balance these things? And I think there's some people who are much less concerned about balancing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, um, and so it becomes, it, it's a very passionate issue. Um, and then I think, you know, the other, the other issue too is even if salmon weren't involved, there are some groups that really want free flowing rivers, right? And and I respect that. I mean, I like to camp and hike and, you know, and and bike and I like to be in nature. Um, and so, you know, those, you know, I understand why it's like, oh yeah, that's, you know, it's great. But again, um, you know, literally millions of people live in the Northwest. And so then we have to make choices, right? Because mm -hmm. more people are coming. So, you know, it, um, we're going to have to get those people electricity and so then we have to make, you know, some choices and, you know, solar power comes with some of its own choices in terms of land use, wind power, you know, in terms of land use and, 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 and birds and things like that. And so we're always, you know, it's like, okay, what's the right balance? And it's just really hard. Um, so I, I am humbled by that. It's mm -hmm. complex. It's hard. Um, but I think that, you know, the thing that we always try to do is whatever we say, you can pretty much rest assured we can document it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that helps me to feel good about our work because I think as long as we're in that space, then, um, then you know, I think that I can say, you know what, we're, we are advocates, mm -hmm. we have a perspective, but that perspective is always based on, you know, on research and, you know, truth. And, um, and I'm not saying, you know, others aren't, but, that's kind of a North star for me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, to kind of touch on that too, neither of us came into our roles here necessarily being, you know, I mean, we weren't beating on the drum of, you know, hydropower advocacy for years and years and years. Right. I mean, we both kind of came from different backgrounds, um, you know, not only from each other, but different backgrounds in terms of uh, how we approach this specific topic. And, mm -hmm. That was one of the things that was really eye-opening. It was to sort of, you know, come in and, and think, oh, I'm sure we'll be able to find, you know, common ground with these guys. I mean, you know, we're neither of us are very argumentative people. We're not controversial people, right? right. And then you start to see, like, ah, these, I don't think anyone's going to budge an inch. And, right. you know, the moment that you don't sort of concede mm -hmm. on the arguments, it's like, well, now I don't want anything to do with you. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know, and that's, and that's a challenge. Yeah. Uh, it's a really big challenge that... Yeah. You know, we've had to, you know, you've had to at some point just sort of accept sometimes it's like, you know, the best we can do sometimes is just agree to disagree and, right. you know, let the facts be what they are. Right. But another thing that I wanted to touch on is a point that you made earlier about the polling, mm. about specifically when people learn more about hydropower, mm -hmm. they are more likely to support it. Mm -hmm. And I know when I started this job, Truthfully, even even with my background, I didn't I didn't know a ton about hydropower. I mean, I was aware of what a dam was. I was aware of how it worked. Mm -hmm. I knew about hatcheries and fish ladders and things like avian predation. I heard about all the time, mm -hmm. but I didn't really even know that the Lower Snake River dams existed. I mean, I just right. knew that there were dams on the Columbia, right? right. And right. so um, it was kind of eye opening to be introduced into all these different things and to start learning about it. And I know for the, you know it was similar for you in the sense of um, learning about what the issue is, mm -hmm. why it is, and mm -hmm. and sort of going through this process of you know even though maybe on the outside as an organization it's like yeah those guys are for all this stuff because that's what the organization has always been for, mm -hmm. coming to a point where we had to personally accept like okay, do I support this or do I not? Like, right. where, where do I morally stand right. on these issues? You know, what do I actually believe? 
And the thing I want to ask you, you know, because I think I think we went through, a, a, you know, not only with fact checking our website, right. but with in general trying to get a better understanding of the issues mm-hmm. and uh, doing research, talking to people, learning more about hydropower, and then finding that as I learn more about hydropower, I'm supporting it more. Right. Yeah, we can. And yeah. so for you, I guess, you know, my big question is, at what point did you really start to actually like believe in the hydropower activist ski? Like you weren't always a hydropower advocate, right? you know, but you came into the role, you start learning. And then when, when does it start to shift of like, okay, like I really, I, you know, this, this is important and I believe in what I'm doing here. Yeah, no, thank you. That, that's a really thought. It is. It's a really thoughtful question. Um, I do want to. I do want to backtrack just one thing. I yeah. did want to say in terms of, you know, people agreeing or not agreeing or things. One place where it's actually been a really pleasant for me mm-hmm. um, engagement is this job has exposed me or given me opportunity to meet with a lot of different uh, Northwest tribal members. Mm-hmm. And um, that is, um, and they're very distinct communities, right? Each each tribe is its own nation, and and things like that. But that's that's a place where you know I had not really had uh, a lot of engagement with with tribal members before I came to this role, and it's been really great. I've actually gotten to work with your grandpa, mm-hmm. you know, on on some of those things because he's been, you know, in around a long time, has a lot of relationships, and um, that's a place where. We've found in many cases like, okay, well, we may disagree on the topic of the Lower Snake River dams, but there are a lot of things we do agree on. Mm-hmm. And, and so uh, working with the tribes, that has actually been like a really great and enjoyable part of my job, you yeah. know. And of course, you know, they're, 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 you know, different tribes have different perspectives on some of these issues. And, and so we respect that. But overall, I would just say that that has, that has not been a place where I've found people to be unreasonable you know um, and so that's been so that's that's that that's one thing I wanted to say but then the other question you asked which was really thoughtful um, was the like when did I really come around well so um, I made a joke when I, I got to be a keynote speaker at this year's Hydrovision mm-hmm. and you know I got up on stage and I'm like you know I said this has always been a dream of mine ever since I was a five-year-old hydropower advocate <laughs> <laughs> and and you know so no um, my hydropower advocacy doesn't go back that far mm-hmm. but um, but I worked um, in the power supply area for Portland General Electric for a lot of my 20-year career at that utility and I did actually get to see the magic of hydropower there because mm-hmm. we started adding you know a really big wind project and, and like I think 400 megawatts in capacity and you know we would see how much that output would jump around, and it, as you know, um, supply and demand of electricity on the grid have to be in perfect balance every second of the day. Well, it was always challenging to balance supply and demand when you could control the supply, right. but then when the supply in, in form of the wind started jumping around in a big way too, not like minor, like not like 25 megawatts, but you could see like hundreds of megawatts of ramping up and ramping down in mm-hmm. very short periods of time or maybe the wind would just totally disappear for hours or even days at a time in, in some cases, right? Mm-hmm. And so you're like, oh my gosh. So that's when, you know, I would, you know, I was working close to the, with the real-time folks and um, you know, the, the people on the desk who whose job it is to actually keep the grid balanced, you know, and they, they were just like, hydro is a godsend, you know, <laughs> like we, you know, that's what they were relying on essentially to make it all fit. Mm-hmm. And so from my perspective, um, you know, I was really interested in this issue of intermittency, intermittency of wind power, intermittency of solar power, right? And and I saw how important hydropower was to that, um, and especially as we start to get rid of coal and natural gas now, kind of hydropower, and then we have one nuclear power plant in the Northwest. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of all we're gonna have unless we get some small modular reactors built. But, you know, where is that, uh, where is that resource that's gonna balance um, all this intermittent wind and solar power um, and, you know, and maybe, you know, batteries are certainly a part of that, but they're, they're nowhere near where they need to be to, to meet like a long-term, you know, extreme weather event and, and things like that. So I came in believing in hydropower. Mm-hmm. What, uh, the, the, the place where I had to make a real, a real decision is what I thought about the lower sink river dams. Right. And, uh, because, you know, North Coast River Partners is about hydropower. Right. It's not we're not Lower Snake River Dam partners. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and so I'm like, well, you know, 
we want to tell people about hydropower. And part of me is like, well, you know, the Lower Snake River dams, it seems like it's so controversial. Maybe we should just stay away from that and we just mm-hmm. talk about hydropower in general. And, um, and especially because I would go to these meetings and I would hear some anti-dam advocates just make some really like bold, definitive statements about what, you know, why the dams are bad for this and this and this. And I'm like, oh, well, they're saying it, so certainly it must all be true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so, you know, I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, and so I would, you know, I, but I think just like you, I try to be thoughtful about things. You know, we, you know we, uh, one of the things we do do here is research. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, the more things that we started to research, the more things I'm like, well, I, that's not actually accurate, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, you know, and it's so uh, some of the claims that are made about what dams do to temperatures in the river. Well, there's certainly disputed information there, you know, mm-hmm. that, um, or the role of dams in, um, in salmon returns. Well, there's some also really disputed information in there. And so all of a sudden you start to build this all together. And then our, and one of the things, and then, and then the other thing we would hear them say is, oh, well, the dams don't provide very valuable energy and, you know, they're losing money. And then we looked into those claims and those mm-hmm. claims weren't accurate. And so all of a sudden you're just like, hey, wait a minute. You know, there are a lot of inaccurate, at least questionable claims that are being made here. And they're using those claims to try to get rid of these dams. And as a hydropower advocate, I had to say to myself, well, gosh, if you can use inaccurate claims to get rid of these dams, you could use inaccurate claims to get rid of any productive dam. And and that doesn't seem right, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and it's not a good public policy outcome. I mean, for us, it's like, you know, these things do have to be based on, you know, scientific evidence and, you know, good data and um, and not just, you know, people's opinions. And mm-hmm. and so, you know, that's been also a guiding, you know, kind of a guiding principle for us. And, you know, so the, and then, of course, I got to spend a lot of time out in the Tri-Cities communities, which has been great, and seeing how important the dams are to those communities uh, that they serve. And then all the public power, right? I mean, you know, the, the thing that they, the thing that we've, you know, done in terms of these research reports, some, some that we've commissioned and others that others have, is that replacing the dams would increase public power customers' costs somewhere probably north of 25%. Mm-hmm. And that's just not something that most communities could afford. Right. Um, and, um, and so, you know, just all of it taken together, it wasn't a hard choice for me once we had done the work. Um, it, but before then, I just, you know, I was like, oh, I want to be open-minded and, you know, and all those things. So mm-hmm. uh, then, when, you know, once we did all the work and the research and it was like really clear to me, you know, these dams provide tremendous value to communities. Uh, getting rid of them would be bad, would be bad for the entire region. Um, and the benefits for salmon are really questionable. Um, and so I think that was, you know, that was the math that I did in my head. And, but you're right, it is a moral choice because mm-hmm. you, um, you don't want to be for something that isn't for the greater good, right? right. You know, right. and um, because, you know, one of the things that like people will comment to me, you know, who I get, you know, work with outside, they're like, oh, you know, you're so energetic or you've got, you know, all this, you know, great energy. But that's because I believe in what I'm doing, mm-hmm. right? And, 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 you know, that's, and if I didn't, then I couldn't do it, yeah. you know? And, um, and so that's like, that's, you know, kind of the secret sauce for me. Um, so anyway, that's my journey uh, kind of on, not so much on the hydro piece, but on the specific Lower Snake River Dams issue. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that that's, you know, a similar experience for me as well. You know, the thing that I joke about a lot with people, maybe behind the scenes more than in my actual job is, you know, I really probably should have been a marine biologist. And I don't mean that in the sense of like, oh, I love science and this and that. But um, it was always kind of the joke when I was growing up as a kid that like, oh, yeah, that, of course, that's what you're going to go do, you know. I was always into Steve Irwin and oh, you know, no way, really? animal, animal documentaries. Oh, no way. And like, okay. I didn't. I don't think I hardly ever checked out a fiction book in the library as an elementary schooler. It was always like I wanted to go straight to the straight to the nonfiction and then straight to the animals. Wow! And like that was always my thing. And we would always go. It was kind of a summer tradition for a long time that the family would go out for a week long or maybe you know a week and a half or something like that up to the San Juans mm-hmm. and. I had all kinds of like stuffed orcas and, you know, I was like, I'm totally going to be a marine biologist. I'm going to study killer whales. Mm -hmm. That was just a, you know, totally my thing. 
And then I kind of got out of that and got away from it as I grew up and got older. You know, that was, you know, I was five, six at the time. So, you know, usually those things don't always stick necessarily. Right. And then I get into college. I'm thinking a totally different path of like mechanical engineering, all this kind of stuff. But at one point I did take a marine biology class. And I remember the, the professor there was like, it's not a career you want to get into. Really? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I was like, really? And he's like, yeah, you know, it's you know, there's a lot of glory about being a marine biologist of like the title and all that kind of stuff. And there's certainly good jobs out there, but a lot of people like, like him, you know, you end up out on a fishing boat in the ocean for, you know, a couple weeks at a time, counting all the dead fish that they dredge up off the bottom and, you know, documenting which species they are and, and things like that. And he said, you know, it's just, it's hard work. So I was like, okay, well, that's definitely not for me then. Like this, you know. Counting dead fish. Whatever. Yeah, that sounds horrible. Whatever hopes or, you know, dreams that I had, ideas of what that might be, you know, that was like killed off at that point. You know, I was like, I don't want to do any of that. Um, but I always, you know, coming into this job, the thing that was interesting for me was salmon. I mean, that was like the dinner table conversation, you know, everything centered around whether it was tribal or hatchery or whatever. It was like it always came back to salmon. It's mm-hmm. like. Well, what are the birds doing to the salmon? What are the sea lions doing to the salmon? And mm-hmm. and I, you know, over time also, you know, got to enjoy fishing more as a, you know, a personal hobby. And so when it all, when I started here, it was like, well, I don't want to advocate for what's bad for salmon. Right, right. You know, because I'm really interested in these fish and I really, I, I care about them. I want them to have a future. That's something I, you know, I would consider myself somewhat of a conservationist minded person. And mm-hmm. I don't want to be advocating for especially you know like to your point if the lower snake river dams are so bad for these fish that's a really hard moral thing to like spend your nine to five right (laughs) fighting for the dams and then go home and be like oh man like what's gonna happen to the fish right right. (laughs) Right? and then and then i did you know as you did you know you start reading the the studies you start seeing the information that's out there on both sides and you weigh it equally and you really you know you need to answer for yourself that moral question of like am i you know, am I on the right side here? Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, I'm like, gosh, this logic just doesn't add up. Right. You know, I mean, there's just certain stuff where my basic understanding of these fish, of how fish work in general, of how, you know, and how river river systems work and everything. I'm like, well, how, how does that add up? You know, or like, how can you say that when a fish leaves a dam four years ago, goes to the ocean and doesn't come back four years later, well, that was that was what happened in the river. Right? Yeah, it's it was like, the dam's fault. Right, right. right. It's like, well, hold on. Like, yeah. how you know? How do we know that? Right, right. We don't. We don't know anything except the fish didn't come back, and right. it was in the ocean. So, didn't it die in the ocean? You know, and and so that that was sort of the you know the point where you start thinking like, okay, you know, th- there's certain things here that maybe don't quite add up, and you start reading the data, and then it's like, you know, you start to really um, transition that way. But I think you hit on a really important point, which is that for me coming at it from the salmon angle Mm -hmm. then starting to see like well this is really important to these communities right right right. you can't do that to those people you know i mean that you know and and even you know speaking especially to covid to the last few years it's like man if you raise people's electricity rates another 25 percent on on top of everything else you know that's just i don't know that's that's something that i personally wouldn't be very happy about right Right, you know and and i wouldn't want to be advocating for it for sure so yeah i mean you've seen i mean rent in your area Mm -hmm. and everything i mean it's just like crazy you know it is but you know one of the things that really did help me too and i and again we always go back to our members because they are great but um, a lot of our members have their own dams Mm -hmm. um and or you know if not a lot you know several Mm-hmm. And so they ha- they employ their own uh, fisheries biologists. Right. right. And so um, we've been working, um, you know, since basically since I started with a group, of, you know, our biology committee, and we meet with them regularly, and and that's been incredibly helpful to me, right, to be able to talk to these um, experts and get their perspective, and I have learned so much, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, because I did come in, uh, you know, knowing a decent amount about energy right you know and mm-hmm. so uh that was kind of my happy place you know i understood you know understood that space but in a job like this you have to understand you know more things right and and salmon is certainly a key issue that always comes up so um and steelhead so that's mm-hmm. been you know that has been that's been really great um so i yeah again 
these jobs, you know, um, you know, energy jobs, I think are always really interesting because, as I said before, they just touch on so many things, right? Yeah. And yeah. so that's that's the thing I think I've always liked about it. You know, I, I started my career at the Bonneville Power Administration in 91 as an intern and then 92 as a full-time employee. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've never stopped learning, you know, for that whole time. And, um, and so I, you know, like, I really like that. I like that aspect of it. And, um, and there's just, there is, there's always so much more to learn. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I really hope to, for, for anyone that's going to listen to these podcasts that we're able to get some of those fisheries biologists, because, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. you know, speaking, like, you know, speaking to my point about marine biology being a tough field, it's like, well, that, that is the cream of the crop, right? You know, that is, <laughs> those are people that have, you know, definitely earned their way to where they are. And, right. and there's a reason that they're in those positions and mm-hmm. they are incredibly smart. So I, I hope people get to hear their perspective. Yeah. 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 No, I think it's, I think it'll be, yeah. I mean, well, we know some of them, so yeah, yeah certainly. we should be it's able just, to do something there. Anyone that's willing to talk, <laughs> we're, we're willing to have you. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. So, you know, I think that really kind of covers pretty much all the bases of, of the organization of, you know, at least, you know, the basics for us. I mean, you could sit here and talk about this, you know, we've been here for three years, right. so there's a lot more than probably you could fit into a, an hour's worth of discussion. But one thing that I do want to hit on before we wrap this up is what's next? What What's kind of the future for our organization? Because, you know, things are, are always in transition. And right now, a lot of big processes have just wrapped up. And, and we've also got some new exciting things on the horizon. But uh, for anyone out there, whether it's a member listening right now, or, or somebody who's maybe a becoming a fan of the organization, you know, uh, what, what can people stay tuned and look out for? Well, we're starting a podcast. So, right, right. <laughs> so that's exciting. Uh, you know, um, one of the things, you know, I really wanted for this organization and it had, you know, a, a good, you know, a good history, mm-hmm. but I wanted us to be like a top tier advocacy group. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, so how does one do that? Right. Yeah. And, and so one of the interesting components of that is that um, in many cases, the best examples of that are groups who are kind of on the other side from us, right? You know, but they've been around forever and you can see like, you know, how good they are or what they do, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, they have different views than we do, but in terms of their ability to, you know, do grassroots stuff and communicate and uh, do campaigns and influence the you know the policy making process and things like that i mean they are they're strategic and they're thinking long you know way out and and you know that's what i you know that's my vision for this organization you know mm-hmm. and so shortly after we started we put together a five year plan um, you uh, you were here i think you know for that and um, and so i think you know for us we want to continue to evolve as an organization that is effective at advocacy but sticks to our principles right, right so right. you know our you know our mission our principles uh, we want to be respectful we want to be you know science based um, when um, we want but and we want to be good partners um, and we also want to be really effective because we believe in what we're doing. Yeah. So, you know, um, I think that, you know, like the efforts that you and I have been talking about behind the scenes and this podcast and things like that, that's just another way. But I think that, you know, you're going to continue to see us, you know, um, do ad campaigns because they have been really effective in raising people's awareness about hydropower. So I think that's going to be definitely part of it. Um, I, um, I would also like us to get more and more involved in uh, kind of community organizing and in that space because um, you know we have there are so many voices out there that are so effective when people hear the sincerity that they and the experiences and the diversity that they bring and so we you know we'd, we'd like to see that um, I mentioned earlier I believe that we uh, we partnered with IBW 77 or that they, they become members and we would like to continue to and and during this uh, Marie Inslee process uh, Quite a few different uh, labor organizations uh, sent letters to Senator Murray and Governor Inslee uh, in support of the Lower Snake River dams, and mm-hmm. so we think you know there's a really natural fit there for a partnership and, and things like that. So you know we're excited to um, you know just continue to look for opportunities to engage. I mean the theme will always be the same, right? Engage, mm-hmm. educate, you know, um, 
raise awareness, mm -hmm. you know, but I think that we're going to continue to always look for the best ways to do that. Well, you know, one last thing I would just say is I do think, you know, while we have partnered with some tribal organizations on some things in terms of salmon betterment and advocacy, I do think there's um, more room for growth there for us as well, you know, yeah. and so that's something that are some ideas that I have that I think could be potentially exciting uh, that, you know, when we've talked to some of some folks who, you know, who, um, who, you know, it's not all about dam breaching. I mean, there's some really, mm -hmm. you know, I think there's some good things. Um, and the other thing just, uh, you, you know, that, that we're always pushing for is better ocean science, right? Yeah. You know, that yeah. so many millions and even billions of dollars have been spent in mitigation and the river, um, and, and that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but if the ocean is where, you know, we're seeing the salmon declines, then we need to understand the ocean better. And there's been so little time spent there. And members of um, the NOAA Fishery Science Center have been really vocal about calling some of that out. And so we're, we're, we would like to support that as well. So anyway, I think there's going to, I think that there's a lot of exciting things going on. Um, and I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities for the future. And, um, you know, I'm glad that we have gotten to be part of the present and hopefully we'll continue to get be part of the future. <laughs> certainly, so we'll certainly. See. And I'm really, I'm really hopeful as well that we'll get the breathing room to, to do that. I know it's been uh, a really busy time for, for both of us and it, it's, Every time you think the marathon over is over, you know, there's obviously a little bit more to go. Right, so, right. Um, but I, I really appreciate, you know, that we've been able to do this even today and have the, have the time to sit down and, and, you know, have a conversation here and, mm -hmm. and record the uh, first podcast. As far as what's next for the podcast, we are looking right now at doing a bi-monthly schedule. So we would do roughly every two weeks. Mm -hmm whenever you do hear this eventually come out uh we don't know when that will be so it, it's an un, undetermined amount of time in the future when you'll be hearing our voices here but uh it's it's a really uh exciting opportunity we've got a ton of names on the whiteboard behind us of people that we brainstormed before we actually sat down and hit record so there's some really exciting folks that i'm hoping we're going to get on here and by the time this comes out hopefully a bunch of those will be already recorded and ready to go uh, and so keep an eye out for that. Keep an eye out for uh, the podcast coming out roughly every two weeks, like I said. As far as where you can find DAM, we're going to be wherever you get your favorite podcasts. So it should be on iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere you like to get your podcasts, you should be able to find us. And in the meantime, be sure to check us out on all of the social media channels. That would be Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn. I think that's everything for right now it's, it's at least the uh the ones that we're most active on and you can learn more about us and sign up to support hydropower at nwriverpartners.org it's a it's not the longest address but it's nwriverpartners.org so that's where you can find us kurt thank you so much for sitting down with me today it's been really fun i think this is a really exciting opportunity for us and i'm really looking forward to the future of dam yeah, me too. By the way, uh, so how do we say it? Because it does have an exclamation point at the end. Do, do you have to really like give it emphasis or how does that go? However much emphasis is required to not spike the microphone out <laughs> and uh, and cause bleeding ears for everyone listening to this on a headphone. That's so. good. Well, it was, it was my pleasure. I'm really excited to get to this stage. This is something that you know, you and I have talked about for a long time, and um, you were able uh, to get us set up and organized, and I really appreciate it, Austin. Thanks for all you do. Absolutely. We did the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Take care. Thanks. Thanks.